I want to talk to you this morning about character from the Old Testament centered around a message simply entitled, Are You Going to Prime the Pump? Are you going to prime the pump? For one, I love studying the Old Testament. And those of you who are in my Sunday school class, <coughs> where we've been going through the Old Testament almost verse by verse, you know how much I enjoy it myself, just studying, getting ready. There's a sim simple um, secret that links the Old and the New Testaments together into a, for lack of a better term, or let's use a good term, together into a unified whole, a, a single consistent story. And that secret is faith. Faith. I love talking about faith. Because you see, the Bible says without faith, it's what? It's impossible to please God. And I want to please Him. Therefore, when I ha have the opportunity to step out in faith, I want to do that. Is it easy? No, it's not. No, it's not. But God requires it. The unifying principle of faith makes the study of the Old Testament a never-ending delight, at least in my estimation. If you read Hebrews chapter 11, which I simply call and others have called, it's not new, I didn't coin the phrase, it's the hall of faith, F-A-I-T-H. You just go down through there and the people who were ahead of us, many of whom were ahead of Jesus as they exercised their, their faith. In the Old Testament, is designed kind of as a picture book. Uh, the books of the Old Testament illustrate to us spiritual truth with fascinating stories, which I guess could be called uh, word pictures. And then those same spiritual truth are presented as principles and good solid teachings in the New Testament. That's why we say the Old Testament, New Testament, got to they, they have to be taken as a, as a consistent unit of teaching. And it's especially true of the Old Testament books of Moses, that is Genesis through the book of Deuteronomy, first five books of the Old Testament, plus the book of Joshua, Joshua, man of faith, and the biogra biographies of people like Abraham, we'll talk about him this morning, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, and Joshua. God gives us a powerful image and riveting stories about um, things that symbolize for us what the godly life, that is the life of spiritual obedience, growth, and progress, should look like. You understand me so far? You with me so far? The New Testament itself shows us that God planned and structured the Old Testament to be read studied and interpreted and interpreted in exactly this manner to show us how we are to obey, to show how we are to direct our discipline towards God. It shows how we are to worship God. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul refers to a number of incidents in the history of Israel. <clears throat> and you've heard me quote this before. Then he concludes with these words. These things happened to them and otherwise those folks in the Old Testament, has examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. Paul's talking to the church. And the church is the last pretty much group on earth, spiritual group on earth, that, is, that it, God has raised up to show forth the, the wonderful things of God. In the book of Romans, Paul writes, For everything that was written in the past was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures we might have hope. These are numerous New Testament, there are numerous New Testament passages. 
notably in the writings of Paul and different teachings, Galatians and others, that clearly show that the Old Testament events are to be regarded as spiritual analogy as well as literal history. You got that? They are to be, events are to be regarded as spiritual analogy as well as liter, literal history. This is the joy of when you come into the New Testament studying something like the book of Revolution, Revelation because it is a combination of symbolism and literal stuff. And as pastor has shared just about every time he stands before you and teaches on Revelation, it's important to know what in that book as well as other prophetical books, what things are symbolic and what things are literal. Literal. And a lot of folks have taken some of these nations that are mentioned in the Old Testament, which have been the focus of our study in Revelation over the last few weeks, They've taken some of those cities, some of those countries, as being simply symbolic of this or that. But those countries mentioned at that time were little literal countries and are referred to in a literal way with practical and symbolic uh, implications. They are used in a literal way in the book of Revelation. So it's important that when we study the Bible, especially when it comes to prophecy, we want to understand what's symbolic, what is literal. Okay? Now, at the same time, we got to guard against wild and fanciful interpretations. We got to remember to observe the rules of sound biblical interpretation so that we will always rightly divide the word of truth. That's the importance of study, Bible study. Paul instructed Timothy, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman. Bible study is work. A lot of people want the ministry, but they don't want to work. Okay? Guys at the mission who feel they're called into ministry are discovering that's a lot of work. When they come to me and say, Pastor Tom or Chaplain Tom, I'd like to get involved in ministry. I'd say, well, are you ready to go to work? See. It's work. Ministry is work, and it's also messy. So if you feel called to by God in any way, and I tell the guys, in any way, shape, or form to ministry, you need to realize that it's a lot of work and it's messy. So if you're ready to, to do the work and put up with some of the messes, then go for it. What'd you say, Nancy? <laughs> well, that's me, always giving an encouraging word. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> it was pretty much laid out to me way back years ago, the work that could be involved in ministry. But not anybody, not anybody, including the fellow who discipled me, told me about the messiness. I had to find that out. My wife can tell you sometimes I just flat out wanted to run. Run from the mess. Let somebody else do it. <coughs> I'd get up some Sunday morning, especially when I was out at Shelter Cove, every time I turned around, people were jumping on me, just talking behind closed doors or whatever about me. And I'd get hear about it and know that I was to confront them, but instead of doing that, I wanted to run. 
You know, I'd, I'd be within 10 minutes of leaving the house, and I'd tell Nancy, I'm not going today. She goes, I mean you're not going. Huh? I know. Keep me humble. Um, it would be a tragic loss to, rit- to miss the rich spiritual truth that are just embedded and ingrained in the Word of God, uh, especially in the Old Testament illustration. But if we extract interpretations that God never placed there, we risk straying into spiritual error. That's why it's important. And the guys are at the mission are looking forward to it here in a few weeks when pastors are going to start. We're going to start with our Veritas Bible Institute on the theme of hermeneutics, which is Bible interpretation. Pastors giving a little bit of that here as we go through. And when whenever you hear our pastors say, now let me unpack this for you. He's about ready to share with you the proper interpretation of what he's going to share. Okay? So when you say, when you hear our pastors say that, let me unpack this for you and pay close attention. One of the clearest Old Testament portraits of spiritual truth is the story of Abraham from uh, his origins in distant Ur of the Chaldeans to his final resting place in a cave near Hebron in the land of Canaan. Abraham is just the, a solid role model of faith. Of faith. I love that guy. I've, list, I've learned so much about faith down through the years from Abraham. And whenever I have a tendency to be weak in my faith, especially stepping out, I go to Abraham. I go to God and his teachings to Abraham. Again and again, the writers of the New Testament hold Abraham up as an example of how God works in the life of obedient, believing people to fulfill his promises of grace. I shared with the Sunday school class this morning <clears throat> that Abraham is not only the father of the Israelite nation, but Abraham, and catch this, especially if you've not heard this before, because this is true. Abraham is also, in addition to being the father of the Israelites, he's the father of all of those who believe. That's you and me. If you're Jewish here this morning, by heritage, Abraham is your father, according to the flesh. If you're a believer here this morning, Abraham's your father by faith. See? Mm. He's chief, like I mentioned a few minutes ago. He's chief among all of the heroes of faith that recorded in, in uh, Hebrews chapter 11. The life of Abraham is a mirror. I look at it as a mirror in which we behold a reflection of our own self, of our own lives. In tracing the story of Abraham, we discover the secrets by which the Spirit of God intends to transform us from faltering, stumbling pilgrims in this world into men and women of stalwart faith. And I hope that's what I can get across to you this morning. By applying the secrets of Abraham's life to our own lives, we're going to discover and we're going to will be made worthy to take our place beside the great heroes of faith in the Bible. How many times have we said, oh, I'd like to be like an Abraham. I'd like to be like uh, Paul. I'd like to be like David. Well, you can. You can. Now, Abraham was originally called who? Abram, A-B-R-A-M. 
And it was not until years later that God changed his name. And that, you, know, you look at how that happened, it's very significant. And we meet Abram for the first time in the closing uh, words or verses of Genesis chapter 11 and the opening verses of Genesis chapter 12. So let me read the closing verses of chapter 11, beginning with verse 27. Genesis chapter 11, verse 27. This is the genealogy of Terah. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Haran begot Lot, and Haran died before his father Terah in his native land in Ur of the Chaldees. Then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarah, and the name of Nahor's wife, Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Iscah. But Sarah was barren, she had no child. That's, that's going to prove to be a, a ministry in faith as well, if you remember that story. And Terah took his son Abram, and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarah, his son Abram's wife, and they went out with them from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land of Canaan, and they came to Haran and dwelt there. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. Now, Abram was born in the Chaldean city of Mesopotamia, Ur in, in Mesopotamia. Tamia. And at that time, Ur was one of the largest cities in the world with a population in excess of 50,000 people at that time. And it was a short short distance, you know, to Iraq and not that far from um, the bank of the Euphrates River just by geographical reference. And the scriptures, for one reason or another, pass over Abram's early life in Ur with only a brief mention. And I feel it, it's as if the Spirit of God wants us to know that the life of Abram did not truly begin until his mon momentous encounter with God in Ur of the Chaldees. In Acts chapter 7, Stephen, the first Christian martyr, gives a speech, great, great sermon, in which he tells us that the call of God came to Abraham while he was still living in Ur of the Chaldeans. And the city of Ur was once thought to be the dwelling place of a primitive people living in mud-walled houses, but they were wrong. Accordingly, some scholars once regarded Abram as a primitive and unlearned man, but he was not. Because, you see, um, to quote one theologian that I was referencing this week, quote, the spade of the archaeologists has since turned up the ruins of Ur and dispelled this false impression. We now know that Ur was a city of great wealth, great cultures, home to a library and a university, and the people of Ur were devoted to commerce, learning, and, and, and also, and this is interesting because God calls Abram out of that culture, it was a, they, they had the pagan worship of the moon goddess. Abraham may have been a worshiper of the moon, we don't know. Or it may be that God chose Ab Abram and spoke to him because he'd already rejected the moon worship of his surrounding culture. Hmm. But anyhow, he left, the, the writer of Hebrews tells us that Abraham left the idolatrous city of Ur and he ventured out in faith. And book of Hebrews says this, notice, looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. <clears throat> In other words, he was looking forward to heaven. Looking forward to heaven. You looking forward to heaven? I am. And because of my age, I'm a lot closer than most of you. All of you, I think. Stephen, the first martyr, 
in Acts chapter 7 declares this, The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham while he was still in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran and said, Leave your country and your people, God said, and go to the land I will show you. Hmm. Now, before I go on, I, I want to lay out a scenario for you, and let's see how it resonates with you by way of application here this morning. You're lost in the desert, okay? Your throat is parched. Your di dry tongue sticks to the roof of your mouth. Just one sip of water, you tell yourself. I'd sell myself into slavery for just one sip of water. Ever been close to that? We were in Yucca Valley here a few months ago, and I'll tell you, they were so hot some of those days we were down there, I said, no, man, let me get back to Doug's house where I can have air conditioning. But you look, and in the distance, you, you see something up ahead, a water pump shaded by a canopy and has you weakly stagger closer you see something hanging on a strap from the pump handle, and it's a canteen. And beside the pump is a sign that says this, beneath your feet is all the fresh, cool water you will ever need. And your heart just jumps with joy. And then you read on. But the pump will not work unless it is primed with water. And then the sign adds this last sentence. The canteen contains exactly enough water to do what? Prime the pump. Prime the pump. You take the canteen in your hand and you shake it, and what do you feel? You feel water sloshing around inside of it. You reach for the cap. Hmm. But then you stop and think and you say, now, should I believe the promise of the sign or not? What if the sign is a hoax? What if the only water for miles is actually in the canteen? And if you trust the sign, you could be pouring your whole life away. You'll drink the water and die. So you've got to make a decision. Will you drink from the canteen or will you take the only water you've seen for days and pour it down the throat of that pump. Will you place your trust in what you can touch and see and hear, or will you have faith in the promise written on the sign? As for Abraham, Abraham was a man who believed, by way of application here, the promise that was on the sign. Many times in his life, he came to a point where all he had to go on was the equivalent of a canteen and a promise. I've been there. Have we been there, babe? Been there. Have you been there? Raise your hand. You've been there. By way of application, all you've had is a canteen with a little water sloshing around it and a promise. Yet Abraham repeatedly proved himself willing to believe the promise. Pour out his canteen, prime the pump of God's blessing in his own life and the life of his physical and spiritual descendants. And think of what that decision did. Mm. Abraham 
Don't lose this. Please don't lose this. Abraham was an ordinary man with an extraordinary willingness to place his trust in the promises of God. And I don't know about you, but I want to be, I, don't, I want to just continue to be an ordinary man who, with an, I want to have an extraordinary willingness to just place my trust in the promises of God. Okay. I'm 77 years old and got a lot more years behind me than I got ahead of me, and I want to spend them just trusting the Lord. God takes me out. I just want to fly out of here and just go headlong, if you please, into heaven. Doing a head first slide and saying, Lord, boy, what a ride. What a ride. So the God of glory appears to Abram while he still lived in Ur in Mesopotamia. And we don't know in what form or appearance God showed up, but he did. But we do know that not only did God show up, but he took the initiative in reaching out to Abram. That's always God's pattern of interaction with us. Think about it. People often think that they are searching after God. We say, you know, <clears throat> I found God. Well, no, you didn't. He found you. God wasn't lost. You were. And he came looking for you and he found you. You glad he found you? If you're here this morning, you know Jesus. You glad he found you? I am. God sought us out while we were still strangers, and the Bible says, and still enemies, the Bible says to him. And in the relationship between God and, and people, God is always the initiator. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, what did God do? He reached out right away. And in his encounter with God, Abram was given a command. Notice the command, verse 1 of chapter 12, book of Genesis. Now the Lord had said to Abraham, Abram, get out of your country, from your family, from your father's house, to a land that I will show you. First, God told Abraham to leave his country. And in a similar way, God also calls you and me out of our country. Our, a lot of times, our place of residence since birth. Abram had to leave his physical residence. It was a place of idolatry. It was a place of commerce that we've come to know, political power, a lot of pleasure. And <clears throat> you and I, in a similar way, are called to leave the old life with all of its ambition and rebellion and it's worship of wealth and power and worship of pleasure. God's called us out of that. Does not mean that he will give some of that back to us. Doesn't mean that. But he calls us away from that. He calls, calls us away from that. And the old life is characterized by a selfish demand for supposed false independence, which is really bondage. Guys that are at the mission that have been on drugs and alcohol. <clears throat> we had one fellow, <clears throat> Zion, you met him. He was here, shared his testimony a couple years ago. Zion graduated from the program, raised in a Christian home. But he stepped out of God's will, forsook good godly counsel, went back home to his, where he'd been in trouble, his hometown, Southern California, which we advised him not to do. He did that, wasn't long. <clears throat> he got in with the old crowd, got back on drugs, got back on alcohol, 
not only wound up in jail, but wound up in a psych ward. His mama got a hold of it, the commission, shared with us. We began to pray for Zion. God brought him back. And he <coughs> he gave his testimony to the guys and gals <coughs> at the mission this last Friday. And he says, it's amazing to me how quickly God put me back on track when he decided to do it. And he got back on track. And he said, before, I was interested in going into kind of a secular workforce to earn a bunch of money. But he says, now, it doesn't make any difference what I get, get paid. I just want to go into ministry for Jesus. Mm. He says, I want to turn, as it were. I want to turn my back on that dying, condemned system, and I want to serve the Lord. Secondly, not only did God tell Abram to leave his country, he says, I want you to leave your people. That is, his culture, the social environment that sought to conform him to its mold. If I just if I'd have come back here after I came to know Christ in 1962, there was nothing for me here but the old stuff. A lot of my friends were still here. So God called me, kept me from doing that. And he likewise commands each of us to separate ourselves from our people and our culture. If it's, keep in mind now, if it's going to be detrimental to our walk of faith. And this doesn't mean, has some have interpreted this to mean. It doesn't mean we are to shun non-Christians and live a life as hermits. It doesn't mean that at all. We're encouraged to, to get in and minister to those who are without Christ, get to know them. It means that we are not to allow the surrounding culture to shape our thinking and behavior. I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, Paul said to the church at Rome, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service of worship. And, he says, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed. The, the, the phrase there, don't be conformed to this world, is simply don't let the world pour you into its mold but be transformed. There's a metamorphosis. That's the Greek word, metamorphosis. A transformation that, transformation that must take place. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Renewing of your mind. And so when God confronts us with his call, we've got to turn our backs on the lures and the moral traps of our society. We're to, we're to renounce all concern about what others think and be preeminently concerned with what God thinks. I've told you before, I grew up in Myers Flat. The sign on each end of town at that time said population 44. There were probably more people than that there, but that's what the sign said. <clears throat> it was probably old. And my brother Stan told me this here six or seven years ago. He said, I was old enough to remember when you left home and went in the Navy and then when you got religion, the way he put it. And he said, I understood a few years later from people that they were taking bets on whether or not you were going to remain true to your religion. And we just, when Stan told me that, we'd just gotten back from our 
50th anniversary celebration there at Riverwalk in Fortuna, and Stan was there. Stan says, and after hearing what I heard today from the different people that stood up and talked about your religion and the part that you've had in that down through the years, he says, I'd be willing to say that there could have been a lot of folks in Myers Flat who lost a lot of money. <laughs> but I was determined. I can turn my back on a lot of that stuff. A lot of that stuff. Hmm. Or to renounce all concern about what others think and be preeminently concerned with what God thinks. People told me I was foolish. Why don't you make something out of your life, they said. Well, I'd made a mess of it. And looking back now on 50 plus years, I'm beginning to think God did a pretty good job bringing me out of that stuff. And I think he's done all right in taking care of my life. I couldn't have done it myself. My wife has tried to change me. She still can't figure out how to do it. So he just turns it over to God. Whenever I hear her think, hear and say, well, I'm just going to turn this over to God, I think, oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> Thirdly, God told Abram to leave his father's house. That is, he was to break his ties with the old man or the old self by application now. Our father, in this sense, is Adam, who's the father of us all. But you see, here's the problem with Adam, the father of us all. The book of Romans says, has by one man, Adam, sin entered into the world. And what theologians call our Adamic nature, our Adamic nature is the father's house in which we all live. in the flesh. And God calls us to leave that. No longer putting any independence or any, any, any dependence upon our natural talents and our natural resources. Instead, we got to begin to walk in dependence upon God. That's what I had to learn. Our Heavenly Father, He can do through us what we cannot do ourselves. Like Ruthie just says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Pretty basic, but very difficult to discover. Hmm. Have you heard the command in your own life to get out of your country by way of application from your family and from your father's house and go to a land that I'm going to show you? I know it was all in God's plan that on September 1st, 1962, that would be the date that I came to know Christ. But from a natural standpoint, knowing what I know now about Jesus, I regret that I didn't do that sooner. It was all part of God's plan. Hmm. Have you heard God call you? Say, you must no longer depend on the old crutches that once supported you. The worldly attitudes, philosophies. Seek a new country. Seek a new people. Seek a new home. Seek a new father. The decision we got to make, it's simple to understand, but it often hard to implement. It means letting go. The hardest thing for us to do is let go of stuff. We just moved into a, another place. And the shop area or the garage type area that I had before is quite a bit smaller or quite a bit larger than what I have now. Oh, I'm happy such difficulty letting go of stuff. Stuff. 
when we moved from Shelter Cove after being there for 20 plus years, my son Doug and his girls showed up at the house, Shelter Cove. We were in the process of moving out. We sold our house, we were gonna move out. Doug shows up, he says, Dad, <coughs> we're gonna help you put stuff in the pickup that's going to the dump. Over there at White Thorn Junction. Those of you familiar with that know where that is. And he said, and you're gonna take it to the dump. And if we hear or catch you taking anything out, we're leaving and you can do all this yourself. And I'm thinking, they're not gonna be able to see me. And then Doug goes, he says, and Dad, we're sending Kimberly with you. And she's gonna tell us if you take anything out of there. Oh, it was hard to let go of stuff. But I had this hope. Maybe I can accumulate some more stuff. <laughs> we got rid of stuff when we moved out of our place at 9th Street in Fortuna. But I thought, I can accumulate more stuff because this place we're going to is going to be bigger. Had the same philosophy or close to it when we move where we are now. But when it comes right down to it, within the kingdom of God, the Bible says, we brought nothing into this world. Therefore, we're not going to take anything out. I'm not going to heaven in a U-Haul that's designated for cabin number 85 in heaven. No. Leave behind. I want to be that way. I'm not done because I want to share something else with you. This threefold command that God gave Ab Abram had a threefold promise. I want you to notice this. The first of these promises is that God would make of Abram a great nation. Notice verses 2 and 3 of chapter 12. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I'm going to read verse 3 a little bit later. And God was going to make Abram a great nation. And he literally fulfilled that through the nation of Israel. And then like we've mentioned, he fulfilled that in faith because of Abraham's faith, because all of us who sit here today, if we know Jesus, are descendants of Abraham by faith. Mm. And it's interesting to note that the in literally um, fulfilling this promise through the nation of Israel, God not only uh, includes the biblical kingdom of Israel or the current state of Israel, but the people of Israel, including all the Jewish people who are scattered around the world. And they're in the process of now of being called back. But what does the nation of Israel symbolize to us in a spiritual sense? So what is a nation? Um, it's the life of a man, the life of an individual, enlarged to a vast proportion. In our day, a nation may be made up of, of millions of families all living together in this big human society, okay, we call human nature. But that's not what a nation is according to the Bible. In God's word, you see, every nation begins with a man. The man starts a family. The family grows and expands. Generation by generation, the family enlarges to a point where it is finally a what? Nation. And in a biblical sense, a nation is the continuation 
and expansion of the life of a single man, in this case, a man named Abram. Like it? God did it with Abraham. God did it with me. God can do it with you. Don't, don't sell God short. God's second promise to Abraham says, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to make your name great, and you will be a blessing. And this promise had a profound and specific meaning to Abram because, you see, as we trace the story of his life, we find that it, that it meant that God would bless him with riches and honor. It meant that God would use Abram to bless the lives of others. He would become influential and effective for God. And God makes the same promises to me, to you and me today. But in the spiritual realm, catch this now. If you're thinking about riches and honor and being a blessing in terms of dollars and cents and material goods, you're on the wrong track on the wrong track. Despite what many proponents, supporters of this prosperity gospel, which is an abomination, would have you believe, God doesn't promise a life of prosperity to any believer today. He doesn't. God does not commit himself to make us wealthy when we become Christians. But he does commit himself to guide and direct us. And he promises to give us all the riches of Christ Jesus. Notice this from the book of Romans, chapter 11, verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both in the wisdom, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I'm rich. I'm rich. And I belong to a fella. I belong to a man, I belong to a God who owns a cattle on a thousand hills. And ever now and then, at his bidding, he chooses to sell a head of cattle and prosper me in one way or another. And he promises that to all his children. And it's, it's, it's a rewarding life of adventure and joy that the world is looking for. They're looking all over for it. Money can't buy it the riches of Christ, okay? Price has already been paid. Jesus hollered with a loud voice, it's finished. See, it's finished. Only in Jesus can we become what God intended us to be. Only in him can women fulfill the beauty of their womanhood. Only in him can men experience the glory of their manhood. The only are through riches in Christ. Finally, God offers this promise, the choice of all, you will be a blessing. Hmm. I was going to sell and uh, share an illustration, but I don't have time to do that. But the bottom line is, a lot of us want, want to just sit around almost like museum pieces and just get old, get old in the faith. Audrey Meyer, who wrote some great songs. I remember <coughs> um, I listened to a tape of her when she came to Weot Christian Church several years ago. And one of the songs that she had written had to do with the fact that Jesus Christ was the way. And she says, a lot of people, a lot of Christians say, well, I'm in the way. And Audrey says, and that's just where they are, in the way. And God calls us to get out of the way. Let him use us. Let him use us. Let me fast forward here. Notice this, verse 3. God says to Abram, I will bless those who bless you. I will curse him who curses you. And in you, 
all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In today's conversational vernacular, God is saying to us, I have your back. I'm going to identify myself with you. Remember what he said to the Apostle Paul when Apostle Paul was on his way to Damascus with letters to kill the Christians? Jesus spoke and he said, Paul, Paul, why are you persecuting me? Identification. We're identified with God. And wherever, wherever we go, we will be either a blessing or a curse. The world, just they, they're not going to ignore us. They can't ignore us if we're serving him. Hmm. The Bible says this, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. For we are to God the aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one, we are the smell of death. To those who don't know Christ, they don't want to be reminded by us. To the other, we're the fragrance of life. Hmm. Let me wind this up. Let's go back to being lost in the desert. We're thirsty. You come upon the canteen that is hanging on the strap from the pump handle. The sign says, beneath your feet is all the fresh, cool water you will ever need. But the sign says, the pump will not work unless it is primed with water and the canteen contains exactly enough water to prime the pump. Let me ask you so. What's it going to be? Are you going to drink the small bit of water in the canteen? Slosh it around. Oh, man, it sounds good. Wow, it sounds good. Slosh. Slosh. I'm thirsty. My mouth is dry. Mm. So you take your cap off. Mm. You're about ready to drink. Mm. Or are you about ready to prime the pump? I've made my choice. I've primed the pump. How about you? Let's pray. Lord, I would have kind of liked to have been there when Abraham was told what you told him to just leave his country, his family culture and go to a place that he didn't know anything about. No, you said, I'm going to show you where, where you're to go. And I'd like to think that if I'd have been one of Abram's kids, I'd have said, I'll go with you, Dad. Wherever God leads, I'll go. And Lord, I'm forever grateful for the night that you called me from a life of sin and to a life of righteousness. Remembering back, I never even gave it a thought of what might lie ahead. I just did it. 
And I learned out, learned a few days later that that was faith. <laughs> and I've learned a lot more about faith over the years. And I've come to one conviction. I ain't interested in departing from it. So, Lord, as decisions are in the balance here with the folks who are in this room, I pray that they make the decision to continue to follow you. If there's anyone here that's not made a decision to follow Christ, I just ask that they'd get off the dime and get with it. Come to know Jesus. Mm. Mm. That's my prayer, Lord. In Jesus' name. Amen.